released its Project Blue Book to the public um, during the Hynek era. Yeah. Uh, Could one say, well, they came first in terms of releasing their files? The Brits came way later. I mean... Oh, absolutely. You remember what Hynek said about that, you guys? Remember what Hynek said about that, Dr. Jalen Hynek? He said... You know, the cases that, that could be easily explained were made public, and the ones that weren't were, shuff, were put aside. I mean, he actually said that on camera. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's right. And there's, there's a, a very specific historical document that makes the same statement, James. There's a general, Carol Bolander, in, in 1969, who, when they closed down Blue Book, which was the, a public investigation body that the Air Force had, uh, Bolander said, well, it's really not a big deal because any UFO report that truly affects national security doesn't go through Blue Book channels anyway. So we have that statement. But it's true that the Air Force was, the U.S. Air Force was really the first, if you want to say that they disclosed. I mean, they, they released the Blue Book files uh, in the mid-70s, and those are available. Britain, at that point, was not releasing a thing. And, in fact, Britain's history of releasing documents, is, I, I think until I'm looking forward to diving into, I really want to study this latest Ministry of Defense release, because I think this could be a little more significant. But up till now, Britain's releases, in my opinion, have been very, very much portrayed as these great, great events, and frankly, have been a whole lot of nothing. Um, I think Britain has a long history of, of doing this, just as the U.S. government pretends to disclose Remember 10 years ago, the CIA said, oh, yeah, we're disclosing about UFOs now. Remember all those UFOs people thought they saw? Well, that was the U-2 aircraft. Yeah, I remember Not that. much of a disclosure, but that's how they right. took it. Britain is very much the same way. They released the, the, you know, the Rendlesham cases a few years ago that everyone made a big, big thing out of. And frankly, we're just uh, 50% of it were duplicate pages and blanked out pages and just you know, not, nothing that was new. Richard, did the Holt memo come out of England, or did that come out of uh, the U.S.? I'm sorry, did the Holt, did the Holt what? The Holt memo, did that come out of uh, Britain, or did that come out of the U.S.? That, oh, great question. That came out of Britain. Okay. It, it was, it was, um, that's, that's right, the British, somehow it leaked out of Britain. I'm trying to review my own history of it. I just wrote about this for my next book. You'd think I remember if you think. Um, it, I think it leaked out of Britain, but then the United States had its hand forced, essentially, because the, the existence of the document was, was acknowledged, and a U.S. version came out. I'm pretty sure I got that right. Mm. Um, but actually, yeah, had it not, had that case taken place in the United States, I think it's very likely known about it, not, huh? the document would not have come out. Yeah. I mean, we'd have the story of Larry Warren, um, which is who's the first person that really pushed this. He was one of the airmen there. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if we would have had supporting documentation. That Halt memo, uh, by, and by the way, Colonel, uh, Colonel Charles Halt just made the news today. Uh, he had his own recent statement, I believe, about what happened at Rendlesham. And, and this is why the Ministry of Defense release of documents, I, get, I think, once again, is a bit overstated. Um, you know, you have the New York Times now chiming in. Well, the MOD's release of documents shows there was a whole lot of nothing. Of course, you'd expect that, frankly, sure. from the New York Times. But, you know, with a guy like Charles Halt, who was the base commander at, at, Rendell, at, uh, uh, at, uh, that, pl- at that institute facility. Yeah, right. Uh, Bentwaters, Reynolds. Bentwaters, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You know, Halt was out there, and he said what we saw was absolutely intelligently controlled. He just made this statement. So now, let's, let's put two and two together. The Ministry of Defense makes this big, big release yet again. Yeah, let me say not, this is not in there. Yeah, let me Obviously. say something really quickly. You know that I met with General Gordon Williams last year? Yes. Uh, you know, and he was the commander of the whole base. Mm-hmm. And what, it was so funny, you know, he wouldn't confirm nor deny the event. But the one thing that he was prepared to comment on, and I did this all on camera, uh, is that he was very, very upset that Colonel Holt wrote that memo and the fact that it was released. And he said to me, and I said, well, why is that? And he said, because it had statements in there that we were not prepared to defend. Wow, yeah. He said this on camera. He didn't say that they were false. No, he did not. They were not said, prepared to defend them. Not to prepared to defend. And that statement, there, there's probably one people listening who, who may not know, but that statement is a very explicit, one-page, single-spaced, 
typed document by Colonel Holt, who was deputy base commander, about these very, very bizarre unidentified lights that were over over the um, Bentwaters base in Britain. And, uh, you know, you read through this document, it's very explicit stuff. Oh, and, yeah, it and is. people it's, have it's, expanded it's, on that. But I think it's almost better than Roswell. Oh, you guys, do you know what I did? In work? terms of documentation, yes. For yeah, the, for the yeah. new film, for Beyond the Blue, or the working title Beyond the Blue, I actually got, for the first time, Neville's and Halt together for the first time in 28 years. And Neville's was out with Halt. He's one of the guys on the yes. voice, on, on the tape recordings with Halt that night. And right at Fabulous. the point where the beam of light, I took the tape and I played it for both of them so they could kind of relive it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, Of course, I filmed all of this. But right at the point where the beam of light comes down at their feet, I stop the tape and I look at both and I say, what were you guys thinking right now? Oh, <laughs> and I was wow. like, can you imagine how intense that was? They're out in the forest and all of a sudden this object shines a beam of light five feet down at their feet. And presumably they're both reliving this in a very, very in- intense manner. Right? Oh, absolutely. And the fact that I got them together and we went out to this little forest area. We didn't take it to good England, but we went out and, and, and you know, we walked around and they, they described yeah. the intensity of that. I mean, could you imagine? No, I mean honestly, not having done it. And then, and then Holt was <laughs> saying they were both they were both saying that these objects were doing a grid pattern search. Well, they said Holt said, well, they're looking for something. I said, how do you know? Because they said they were doing a grid pattern search, and they were shooting beams of light down into the weapons well, storage area. That base had nukes, yep. and no one knew it at the time, yep. or other than a small, you know, select group. Hey, James, we're going to lose you soon, so I want to get you to uh, at least wrap up your portion with us, and. Uh, I, what do you do next, James Fox? Of course, you're working on this movie, but you don't stop. What's next for you? What, I'm, what I'm, my plan is, and I can't reveal all of it, but but, but my plan is is that I want to go on a uh, tour. Uh, this is our exit strategy with the film, and I want to do a multi-city international tour uh, along with a panel of, of high-ranking military and government officials and invite the media uh, so there could be a Q&A session at the end of uh, each, you know, screening and, and screen it in strategic areas. You know, maybe uh, I have a number of different ideas of, of where to do this. So that, if I could get a bit of a media uh, buzz going about the movie, I think that that would increase our chances of getting it uh, picked up by Sony or Miramax. Um, obviously, we're, right now we're, we're concentrating primarily on doing the best job we can. We've got a really, really good crew of people, uh, a lot of great contacts in the media, but but... I really want to get a real buzz going. It's something to the, you know, of the caliber of the National Press Club event, but but in multiple cities. Well, you're a home run. James Fox, Richard Dolan will stay with us because next we'll open up the phone lines, give you an opportunity to talk with Richard Dolan about some of the things you've heard tonight, and maybe, maybe you had a close encounter of the third kind. Okay, we've got Richard Dolan, and we're going to take your phone calls when we come right back on Coast to Coast AM. Richard, what are some of the best UFO cases that you've uh, investigated or at least found some documents on? Well, there's there's a really, really good uh, short list of key UFO documents that I have been uh, kind of sifting through. And um, I, I mean, I think in terms of something that I would present to a skeptical or or on-the-fence public, um, the, the 1981 HALT memo that we were discussing a lot with James Fox earlier, I think, is one document uh, relating to the Rendlesham case that is extremely important. Um, there's a couple of classic cases that I think just will never, ever lose their importance. There is a very famous uh, series of jet interceptions in 1976 over Tehran. Now, this was back in the days when uh, the Shah was alive and Iran yes. was an ally of the United States. And back then, uh, the citizens of Tehran saw this blinding light in the sky above their city. Uh, they called their local airport, who then contacted the Iranian Air Force, which, of course, was supplied with F-4 jets, courtesy of the United States. There were two successive attempts by f 4s to intercept this object. We have extensive documentation on this. Each time those, those F-4 fighter planes came within 25 nautical miles of this object, their communications and electronic systems went offline. It's an incredible thing, and this is all written about in a document that was cc'd to the uh, U.S. State Department, that is to Henry Kissinger, to the President of the United States, uh, that is Gerald Ford. I mean, holy 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. amazing. It's- we we had the Iranian pilot on some time ago. Yes, yes. Who, who 